Our next panel, Hollywood Media and Education, the three strongholds of the left. Please welcome Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you very much. You know, four years ago, um, I made the film 2016, Obama's America, which, which kind of upset the thin-skinned narcissist in the White House. And so for a relatively minor campaign finance infraction, I was locked up overnight for eight months in a federal confinement center. Now, I just want to, I just mentioned that because I want to tell you that if that film got me eight months in the slammer, this new movie is going to earn me life in prison. <laughs> Look, it's time to take the gloves off. And as you got a glimpse from this film, it is a sordid, history of the Democratic Party from the very beginning all the way through Hillary. <laughs> the Democrats want us to believe that the party of equal rights and human rights and civil rights, the truth is the Democrats are the party of slavery and Indian removal of broken treaties and the trail of tears. They're the party of segregation and Jim Crow and lynching and the Ku Klux Klan. They're the party of Japanese internment and opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Fair Housing Bill of 1968. This is their actual history. <clears throat> So what they do is they try to cover it up. And the way they try to cover it up is by blaming America. America did this and America did that. But the reality is that America didn't do it, the Democrats did. <laughs> now, another story from the Democrats is that they changed, that somehow recently they became enlightened and they became the good guys and the bad guys all became Republicans. This is the story of the so-called switch. But the truth of it is that there never was a switch. The Democrats are now the same as they always were. One thing I learned in the confinement center is that crime is about stealing. Lincoln understood that slavery is about stealing. He, he summarized the essence of slavery as, you work, I eat. Now, if you think about it, this concept of you work, I eat is still the center of the politics of the Democratic Party. They were playing plantation politics back then, and they're playing plantation politics right now. Now look, we're, we're going to release this film the week of the Democratic Convention toward the end of July. <laughs> They're going to be telling the history that they want you to know, and we're going to be telling the story they don't want you to know. Here's how you can help us. Go see the film opening weekend. It's a little secret about movies that the fate of a film depends upon opening weekend. We'll open wide in 1,500 theaters. If we do well in opening weekend, we'll be in 2,000 theaters the next week. If we do poorly, we'll be in 1,100 theaters the next week. So you, if you want to know what can I do, for 10 bucks, you can put fuel in our rocket by bringing your friends together and going to see the movie when it opens. This is how you affect the politics of Hollywood. Now, that being said, I'd like to introduce Mary Catherine Hamm, who's going to be our moderator for the next panel on Hollywood and education.
How's it going? Saturday of CPAC. I feel like things have changed for me since I first started coming here. Saturday of CPAC, I really used to maybe have a little hangover. <laughs> and now I have two kids, and I feel exactly the same. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for being here. I want to introduce our panelists for this, uh, this panel on uh, Hollywood media and education, the three strongholds of the left. We have Dinesh D'Souza, who you guys have met. <laughs> Author and filmmaker. We have actress Cameron Goodman, who has appeared. Thanks, guys. <laughs> she's appeared, among many other things, on Mad Men and Sons of Anarchy. And she studied economics at Georgetown, so she's pretty well-rounded. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mark Hemingway, senior writer at the Weekly Standard. And we have me, who has watched a lot of TV and movies. <laughs> so got this thing figured out. Um, I want to start out by saying, as conservatives, certainly we look at culture and higher education and we say, yeah, we're pretty outnumbered, right? <laughs> but I don't want to just complain about it. So I wonder if you guys have some thoughts on what are some high points for us in pop culture or in higher education that you're seeing at the moment. I'll start with Mark. Well, I, I think you're seeing the crumbling of a lot of institutions, in, in part because they have become overwhelmingly liberal and imbalanced. Um, the, the liberal values that are being put forth in, term, in higher education are not you know, the classical liberal values that were once valued in higher education. And as a result, uh, higher education is dependent on government you know, financing to even exist, and they're crumbling because their tuition is too high. So right. that's actually kind of a positive thing, you know, <laughs> with uh, online educational tools and some great universities, uh, non-traditional universities popping up like Hillsdale and other places. I, I think it's a real... <laughs> I think, I, I think that's a, a real positive sign that we're going to be looking toward a future where we get to rebuild some of these institutions. Um, Cameron, I just want to say, between Stacey Dash, who appeared in Clueless, and you, who appeared in the reboot of 90210, 16-year-old uh, Mary Catherine is so pumped to be here right now. Uh, she's so jealous of me. Um, let me ask you about sort of how you got your start in Hollywood and, and what are ways that other folks could get their start or uh, see, see more high points and more folks like you out there? Okay, so I have good news and bad news. Wow, my mic's really loud, so I'll whisper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually quite loud. Um, I was actually interning on Capitol Hill. I grew up in DC. I started interning when I was 12, um, and I loved it. And then at 19, I was like, well, I'm gonna check out Hollywood. So I got in my car, I drove out to LA, and I started acting. And uh, I think there's a big jump there, but the answer is Hollywood is not structured, so there's a million ways to get involved and get invested. Unfortunately for conservatives, there's no encouragement <laughs> at all in that community, and you do feel stifled, and a lot of times you feel alone in that culture. But having been there, it's funny how much goes under the radar. Like, people find out you're conservative, like, oh, you're a conservative? Oh my gosh, let's talk, let's go have a coffee. I want, blah, blah. And there's huge, tons of large uh, communities of conservatives out there that kind of keep it on the DL because they know they have a lot to lose if right. people find out. And usually it's from your representation who won't put you out for those roles, you won't even get those opportunities, or it might be from people who've already hired you for projects, they won't rehire you for the next right. season. I mean, there are, there are huge penalties yeah. to being open about you're conservative. conservative. Well, and Dinesh, you've, you've sort of broken through. You've made your own films. You've done your own projects your own way. Um, tell us about how that process works and, and how you think it influences this. Well, I, I kind of got the idea for 2016 from Michael Moore. I mean, he had dropped Fahrenheit 9-11 into the middle of the It's 2000s. rare that you hear that on the CPAC stage. Well, but. I just thought if he can do it, <laughs> I should be able to do it. Um, <laughs> But it, it is true that the only reason we, we were able to get in is we did it independently. We didn't work through a studio. We went to independent investors. It's a lot tougher for our side. Right. Uh, think of a guy like Bill Maher. What does Bill Maher do? He stands up and tells jokes. That's all he does. And his only job is to get ratings. The left will do everything else for him, right? right. What do we do? I, have to, uh, I make movies, but I've got to raise money. I've got to prepare business plans. I've got to market the movies. I've got to create. So in other words, we have to do it from the beginning and from the ground up. It's a greater challenge, but that's because they dominate the industry. Right. Well, and I think, as Mark was saying, there are more opportunities now with 
Netflix distributing films and, and shows, and uh, you, you can do a YouTube series if you want. These things, the barrier to entry is different than it was before. Right, I, I think that's exactly right. And you, and then the important thing is you have to capitalize on that. I, I think that, you know, we say this a lot, but the reason why a lot, liberals dominate a lot of these institutions is frankly that they show up a lot of the time. <laughs> um, uh, conservatives don't always go to, Holly, conservatives go to Hollywood and, and they don't be, you know, out and proud about it necessarily because they, they want to succeed in their, their given field. Uh, academics keep their mouth shut about their beliefs because they want to get tenure. Um, and uh, we need to, you know, stand up, you know, and, you know, either hang together or because we're doing a pretty good job of hanging separately at the moment. <laughs> right. It's true. And I do think there is an issue where when somebody sticks their neck out, we, we don't always catch them when they fall. I mean, right. the Democrats just <laughs> like piranhas in the water immediately demolish whatever point or whatever great idea they had to contribute. And it really is our responsibility as other conservatives, that if we want that, to, that change to take place, we really need to go out of our way to support them when we see them making strides. And when you're in a creative community and, or out in Hollywood where you are going to be outnumbered, what are, what are other types of networking you can do, basically? To, that sort of like, let's not worry about the politics at the moment and let's hook into other areas and find your, your people. Like, is there, do you see what I'm saying? Like, I mean, it, I feel like the answer is go to church. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Okay, that's good. But in that, in that vein, there actually is a huge movement of, at, of the church scene in LA. It's a huge oh, okay. revival. I mean, my church was so full. We had three sessions a day. People were standing outside listening to the sermon on speakers. So there, yeah. I mean, there certainly are a lot of. Well, groups. and it's funny you mentioned church because that is one thing I want to talk about because when we talk about you know, institutions being destroyed by liberals and we talk about the usual suspects, media, Hollywood, higher education, but, but one thing that nobody talks about, for instance, is that starting in the 1960s, liberals also did their long march through mainline Protestantism and a lot of other you know, valuable religious institutions now to the point where uh, the religious infrastructure in this country isn't what it once was. We used to have a lot more weekly churchgoers, and that's been very bad, I think, for our body politic and very bad for certainly you know, conservatism as well. Um, so that, that's one thing to keep in mind, too, when we think about institutions, uh, because a lot of these churches, even if they're dwindling in size, still are very influential, and they have very overtly political agendas that I think are, frankly, contradictory to their theology. Mark is making this very important point that we have been narrowly focused in one corner of the battlefield on politics. Right. The left has recognized the larger, um, th they've taken control of the big megaphones of our culture. And ultimately, we have to fight back there. Now, with the universities, which you mentioned earlier, it seems to me there's a technological opportunity because the universities are hampered not so much by the fact that they're left wing as by the fact that they cost a preposterous amount of money. Right. And so this is, a t this is a time where if we can, in effect, we don't have to retake the campuses. We can't do that. We'd have to build 300 colleges. Right. <laughs> um, but if we can build the academic iPhone, i.e., if we can build a way to deliver educational services at a fraction of the cost, we will wipe out that entire industry. Yeah, I think, I think you're right that as, as things modernize, we have the chance to make inroads here. I think another place where we have a chance to make inroads is, you know, Hillary Clinton's running for president, and one of her, one of her positions is that she would like to just scrape off some of the First Amendment because some political speech is not cool with her, right? That's, that's what they want to do. Um, and on campuses, you see over and over again, they're not huge fans of speech uh, <laughs> that they disagree with. And I think we have an opportunity, perhaps as conservatives, to say, yeah, we're not the school marms. We're not the ones tis tisking you on the things you watch. You know, I, I remember, at, I think it was University of Michigan was like, no to American Sniper. Just a totally mainstream blockbuster film about American troops, no big deal. I think we have an opportunity there. I wonder what you guys think about that. Uh, I, I think there's absolutely an opportunity. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't become a conservative because I didn't want to have any fun. <laughs> um, and more, more to the point, uh, being, if being counterculture is cool, well, well who's counterculture right, right now? Right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, and, 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 and 
and, and when you think of it exclusively in speech terms, there is power in being able to say the things that should not be said. Now, obviously, that can go into some dark territory, as we've learned in, in recent months. Um, but it is very true that the person, you know, standing in a room full of people telling lies that is telling the truth is all of a sudden going to become somebody who's very powerful and influential. And, and I think that we need to recognize that and use that power responsibly. You mentioned the word cool, and I think that the reason the left monopolizes cool is that they have... <laughs> hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm talking about in the public... Know, you know, they've, exactly. got, they've got Bill Maher, they've yeah. got Jon Stewart, uh, they've got Colbert. So we need some competition here, right? And so young people often say, well, when I graduate, what organization should I join? And that's important, but I'll, I'll, I think the better question is, what needs to be done? Like, here's a marvelous opportunity for young people in the world of comedy to take the ideas of conservative politics and translate them into a language that young people find not only amusing and entertaining, but informative. Yeah. Well, I think on the comedy front, you see various comedians coming out who are no, no conservatives saying, I don't do college campuses because these people are crazy and they decide that everything <laughs> I say is offensive. Um, Seinfeld has said that. Bill Maher has, has yeah. chimed in Chris on this. Rock. Uh, Chris Rock, of course, has said it. Um, and I actually quite enjoyed Chris Rock's uh, Oscars monologue. Might not have let my kids watch it, but <laughs> his Oscars monologue, because he struck at this outrage industry and said, hey, guys, I know you wanted me to boycott. Uh, Oscar, hashtag Oscars so white. But here I am, and I'm not going to spare anybody. And he actually didn't spare anybody. He actually went after the left a bit in that. Um, and so it was refreshing to see that. And I think comedians are sort of canaries in the coal mine on this. They're saying, I can't do my craft anymore because everyone's offended all the time. Right. I, I think the saying is, you know, that we hear a lot is something's funny because it's true. And again, you know, I, I didn't necessarily become a conservative because I wanted to subscribe to some ideology and meet people at a convention hall. Um, <laughs> I did it because I thought this best embodied what I recognize as the truth. Right. Um, and, and I think that that's the way to look at it. Um, and the problem is, is I, I do think that because conservatives have been marginalized, a lot of our views get contained within conservative institutions right. uh, um, and don't branch out into the larger, more influential institution. So I think the key is to you know, be fearless, recognize that you're speaking the truth, and then get out there. To that point, Cameron, I did want to ask you, you're somebody who went to Hollywood and was just, just like, I'm doing this, I'm engaging, I'm getting in the culture here, um, and you've been successful at it. What are tips for other folks who, not just, I, I see a tendency a lot of times on, on Twitter, I, my, I joke about it, I was like, stick to the issues, I'll write about, you know, just something I watched on TV and people get upset <clears> with me. <throat> my take is like, like, I can't just stick to the issues, I need to talk about things that normal people talk about because Politics is about reaching normal people, and so I have to pretend to be one sometimes. Um, but what's your take on engaging versus sort of turning off the TV and tuning out? I have so many thoughts about this because I actually believe that most people that I encounter are reasonable people, even Democrats, so I'm not necessarily going into situations where they're screaming at me or really angry at me, but a lot of times what I'm recognizing is the heart of their argument, and then I need to change it so that they see the heart of our argument. So to put that more bluntly, you know, they want to make the world a better place. Great. Let's show them how voting Republican is making the world a better place. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on board with that. I think sometimes when we go into entertainment or movies from politics, uh, a mistake that conservative and Christian movie makers make is they tend to look at movies as a form of messaging. Hey, Dinesh, make a movie on Obamacare. Yeah. Hey, Dinesh, expose the, what's going on at the border. Right. Now, no one goes to the movies for messaging. Right. You go to the <laughs> movies for entertainment. Story, right. And so even Michael Moore, buffoon though he is, understands that. He makes <laughs> movies that are entertaining, and that's why he's had a lot of success. I mean, you've got to give it to the guy of the top ten documentaries of all time. He has five yep. in the top ten. Wow. Now, if you make a movie that is emotionally compelling and entertaining, you can do a whole lot of messaging and people will digest it very happily because the main objective of them going to the theater has been met. And I, that's the key right. to the success of our types of films. Oh, you mean you, you should just go and make good stories? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, well, to italicize this point, the big guy in Hollywood is not Michael Moore, it's Steven Spielberg. Right. The most powerful films are not documentaries, I hate to say. They're, they're romantic comedies, they're horror films, animated films. 
uh, thrillers, ultimately we've got to do that kind of stuff too because they tell their worldview through stories. And you know what else is interesting on that point is, and I do think by and large that we need more screenwriters, TV writers who are Christian, and we have some, they aren't as active, but you know, as they progress up the ranks in their own careers, we'll start to see more of their work. And actually, to be honest, on my end, I do see a lot more work. Mm -hmm. um, that I would identify as Christian and following in my morals, which is so exciting being in this industry. <laughs> yeah, please clap for that, because I do think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's shocking to me, the messaging can come in one line. Yeah. The message can come in a laugh at the wrong place. And I was in an audition the other day, and I realized, this is actually, oh, that's an exaggeration. It was probably two years ago, but. <laughs> <laughs> It was a huge show. It was a great audition. I was doing great. And there was a joke at the end of the scene that made fun of God and made fun of people who believe in God. Mm -hmm. And I had that moral crisis of, am I going to stand up to the machine? Am I going to make this joke? Yeah. And I even omitted the joke. And then the casting director sits there and goes, actually, Cameron, can you make the joke? And I was, it was that moment where I was just like, oh, it's all coming down to this, yeah. huh? And I was like, actually, you know, I know that's what it was supposed to say. I just thought it was offensive, <laughs> and I didn't want to say it. <laughs> yeah, that's a really tough call, and I, I appreciate y'all's point about uh, entertainment versus messaging, and I think a perfect example of that that we should all be very excited about at the moment is the Broadway play Hamilton. Yeah. OK, this is Definitely. a, I, I did get to see it. It was great, and it, I would say it lives up to the hype. Um, but it also lives up to the hype for me as a conservative who loves the Founding Fathers. I mean, it almost felt like it was written for me. I was like, wait, a hip-hop rock opera about the Founding Fathers with a rap battle about the central bank debate. I'm just surprised everyone else likes it. Um, <laughs> but the beauty of this play, and it is like the hottest ticket anywhere, the beauty of this play is it is truly unironically a celebration of Alexander Hamilton, pulled himself up from his boot bootstraps, came from nothing, fought with just his brain, and got to the top of you know, American society and really shaped this beautiful thing that we have. And it is serious about that message. But because it is built into all this pageantry and cool factor, and it is very cool, uh, you get such an incredible story about these guys. And it doesn't have to be a bunch of liberal talking points throughout the whole thing. Well, I think that's key. And, and the culture is the vehicle where we can talk to each other without, about these important issues without you know, everybody having labels and preconceived notions that you know, preclude a lot of debate. Yeah. I mean, if I, you know, people meet me and, and they know that I'm a conservative journalist. They, they very definitely treat me a certain way. But if I meet somebody in a bar and I start talking about you know, how I like Coen Brothers movies and Sonic Youth first, then you know, we're speaking the same language. Right. Right. You know, and, and then they take my ideas a little more seriously than just thinking, oh, you know, there's that, you know, awful guy. Yeah. Right. I, I don't they know why anybody would ever later. think that yeah. about me, but. Uh, I, I think the big shift that's happened in the last 10 years has been that conservatism for almost a generation was a, was a critic of culture. Yeah. Uh, we would expose media bias and we would expose Hollywood. And we'd spend a lot of time saying what they don't do. But we, we ignore the fact that they're controlling the real estate. It's their property. They can do whatever they want. It's their film, right? Now we've realized if we really want to be in the game, we have to make our films. Yep. And, and there, are, there are very sneaky types of opportunities. If you want to make a deeply theological film, my advice to you is make a horror film. <laughs> because within horror, you can subsume the most profound theological yeah. themes, and you can be explicit about it. About, I saw recently this movie called The Conjuring. It's not a great movie, but it's about an exorcism. It's about a woman who's possessed, and the exorcist is trying to get the demon out, and her husband comes running in, and they grab the husband and fling him against the wall, and they scream at him, we are fighting for her soul. Uh, this is a sort of profound Christian argument being made in the middle of a completely secular movie and nobody's feathers are ruffled in the slightest because it's embedded in the story. I, I love that idea, I love horror movies, and Cameron, you will be my scream queen. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it's really exciting how the landscape is changing, um, and I love the points you guys are making about just go out and make things, tell stories. I think that's something that 
often conservatives have not been great at doing it, connecting at the heart and telling those stories. And we have plenty of stories to tell. So um, I actually think comedy is just as potent because I think people let you get away with anything when you're funny. <laughs> Everybody knew that in, Tell me about in high school who could just say the worst things and people still loved him. Yeah. And you were like, what? Uh, that's terrible. I, I mean, I, it's really amazing because you think about all of the films that are like classics that they made a couple of decades ago that you literally could not make today. I mean, Blazing Saddles actually has a lot of profound things to say about race relations, and you could not make that movie today. And I really think that, you know, on some level, people have to be thinking, why is it we can't say these things? And is it toxic that we can't just, you know, be honest about everybody's feelings and laugh about it? Well, I look forward to finding ways to say those things, finding ways to tell our stories. And I want to thank all of our panelists for being with me today. Dinesh D'Souza. Cameron Goodman, who I'm going to look for now. Thanks, guys. Mark Hemingway. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.